I'm Murphy, a service tech at a quick lane tire and auto center. I need help. They always do. I'm overdue for an oil change. No problem. Tire rotation? Got it. Top off the fluid? Yep. Check the battery and filters? Roger. The sprocket lockets? No such thing. Seeing if you're listening. I haven't stopped. Now, today's Saturday, and I don't have an appointment. Now you do. Cool. Very cool. No appointment necessary. Weekend hours and trained techs ready to give your car the works. Quick lane is ready to serve. Visit quicklane.com. When your fingers grace your nimble wireless keyboard, do you feel a connection? Do you consider your 8-gig memory laptop your office BFF? If so, you might be gear-centric, someone who knows that the right office gear helps you do great things. And at Office Depot and Office Max, we have the quality tech gear you need. Right now, all PCs are on sale, like a 15-inch HP laptop for $249.99. Office Depot and Office Max, gear up for great. Valid in-store only, offer ends 117. Justice for All. I'm George Yates, and um, this is uh, uh, Joanne Mertens in One Woman, uh, One Woman and Three Prisons. What were the three prisons that you worked in, Joanne? Well, the first one was uh, called the oldest prison west of the Mississippi. It was Missouri State Penitentiary. It closed now in 2004, and it is now a uh, a place for ghost tours, but it, it was a very old prison, and so that's where I started out. It was an all-male maximum security prison. Well, now, I think most people that are listening to a show like this uh, and uh, are fascinated with prison life. Most people, uh, I would guess, <laughs> have not been to prison, uh, but prison movies are fascinating. I never uh, flip the channels without uh, seeing Shawshank, Redemp Shawshank Redemption, and of course I have to watch it every time. Uh, mm -hmm. They escape from Al Alcatraz. Whatever the prison movies are, they're always very cool. And then there's the 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 uh, the Netflix show Orange Is the New Black. Have you ever seen that show? I haven't, but I've heard about it, and it's a totally different take than I have. Yeah, you know, Orange Is the New Black, and I got a kick out of it. There, you you talked about your encounter with a homosexual uh, and a homosexual inmate at one point that kind of came up to you, and you mm -hmm. said that she was a predator. Uh, and yes. uh, and uh, so I, I said, okay, orange is the new black, and I, I and you also you you started out in the mail room and you read some letters of a young man apparently who was uh, being raped in the prison, uh, you yes. know. So uh, what is what is I think that that's the first thing that a lot of people think about in in prison is what kind of violence is going to be there uh, either between the inmates or what kind of sexual. Uh, assaults are going to take place what what did you you're during your career uh in the penitentiary system how much of that did you see well physically see not as much but i was involved in various uh, incidents you know because of of what had happened happened to certain people but um it depends on the security level of the prison the maximum security prisons are going to have more of that type of thing. Now, there was a lot of consensual acts, and some went out to keep with the same-sex people. Others went out to their partners of the, of the opposite sex. So some of it was sex of convenience, especially if you were locked up for a long period of time. But uh, like the thing with the young man, I was 24 years old when I started reading this, and you really had to follow along, you know, and I tried to get his letters so that I could see what was happening to him. But I was so naive that I didn't understand rape in a prison. And so I had to ask a couple of the males that worked in the mail room, and uh, they had a great big laugh over that one. <laughs> so... But the other woman, she was very much of a predator. And, uh, you know, my answer to her was, you know, as long as you don't bother someone, I don't worry about it. But when you bother someone, you answer to me. 
And so, you know, there's been various different things about that. Now, Missouri State Penitentiary was your first institution, and that is a maximum security prison? Yes, for men. And is that also a penitentiary where they had the gas chamber and did executions? It was, yes. I noticed that in your book here, and the name of the book is One Woman, Three Prisons, you had a photograph, I guess, from the wall of the Missouri State Penitentiary that had photographs of all of the men that had been executed there by the gas chamber uh, uh, in in the Missouri State Penitentiary. Um, Were you there during executions during your time? I was working there, but I never had to witness one. Uh, Uh, Several people I know did, and, you know, it was not a pleasant experience at all. But luckily I didn't have to witness that because at that time, see, I was a woman that didn't have as many privileges as the male officers did to go down inside. Yeah, last week we had a woman on, her name was April Moore. She's a writer from Colorado, and she wrote a book called Folsom's 93. And that book was about the 93 men that were executed at uh, Folsom State Prison between 1895 and 1937. And she wrote a book that detailed every single one of those individuals. And they were executed by the gallows uh, uh, through a hangman's noose and dropping through the trap door, that whole thing. And they abolished that uh, penalty in 1937 in California and went to the gas chamber. And then I noticed that in your book, all of these men were executed by by means of the gas chamber. Uh, you were you were um, uh, really a woman in a all male institution. Um, and how many other women were there when you were uh, when you first started out at the Missouri State Penitentiary? Well. Um most of the women, there were women working there, but none went down inside, as they call it, into the housing units and cell blocks and whatever. Uh, they were clerical workers for the superintendent and, what, and wardens and whatever. But I was the first woman in the mail room. And then when I actually became a corrections officer, well, first of all, I became what they called a corrections matron because they didn't know what to do with us, but they needed people to run the visiting room. And so there was two of us, another lady who has now passed away, and I became corrections matrons. Then after a year or two, we became corrections officer one, like, you know, the men. But I'd like to tell a funny story, if I could. Go ahead. Um, I... As a matron, I read the big article in the newspaper. It said corrections officers getting, oh, a big increase. And I was so excited. And so I went in to my boss, and I said, when are those raises coming? And he looked at me rather oddly, and he said, you're not getting a raise. And I said, why not? He said, because you're a corrections matron. You're not a corrections officer. Well, you, you, it's for you, the you, men. You, you talk about that throughout your book, how you encountered that glass ceiling. Where oh, you, yes. you believed that you were qualified uh, to move up in the ranks. And uh, you, you were number two at, 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 at I guess, at, at a couple of institutions, right? But mm-hmm. you, nev- you, were ne- you were never elevated to the number one position. Is that right? Never, and that was my goal. I, I didn't reach it, but it was my goal. And and you feel that you should have gotten that number one position, but you were barred uh, because of your sex and because of, uh, I guess, uh, discrimination, the glass ceiling, as you refer to it? Yes, and um, I would have to say by, by that time, which was in, um, what did I retire, 1990, um, no, 2000, um, there was also, when you got up that high, the politics were also unbelievable, mm-hmm. you know. And there were some women that did go up that far, but not for me. Right. Well, they must have done some other things, maybe. They might have. <laughs> so, so being a woman in a male institution, I think most people listening to this are saying, well, wait a minute. We've never seen that in the movies. It's always the male guards and the male inmates, and here you are, a female actually down there in the trenches, as they say, with these male inmates. How did that work? Were you sexually harassed by other inmates? Uh, Did you see encounters between other female guards and inmates? What was that like interacting with men on a daily basis, especially men hardened criminals such as this? Well, 
I would have to say that working with the staff was harder than working with the inmates. Oh, okay. Uh, if you... There was, I learned from a wise person, fair, firm, and consistent. And if you were that way, the male inmates would respect you in most cases. Now, there's always, you know, an odd case somewhere. But that's what I tried to be. And uh, I never really had problems. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Now, there were women... When we finally got down in what we call inside the prison, there was one young woman that was grabbed, and, you know, there was uh, things like that. But I never encountered anything. I guess my harassment came from the male officers. Right. You make a comment in your book. You say, I could be rich today if the laws had been there and enforceable. So you were the subject of some... uh I guess some EEOC violations or sexual discrimination or sexual harassment, I guess, as you went through your career. Well, I think one of the funniest ones when I look back on it, but really wish I could have filed something, is when I started to take my sergeant's exam and there was no female sergeant anywhere and you had to have a written exam and an oral exam. And I did the written and made very well on it. When I came to the oral there was one major, one assistant warden, and someone else. And the questions that they asked me, well, first of all, they said, well, where do you intend to work? And I said, well, I intend to work here. <laughs> you know, well, there's no women. There's no female sergeants. And I said, well, I'm still qualified. And it went on like that. None of the questions were reasonable at all. And at the end, the old guy that was sitting there, and I know his name today, but I won't say it, said, well, let me ask you, Joanne, are you a woman's liber? I said, no, but I believe in equal rights. And that shut the whole thing down, and I got a good grade, and I did eventually make sergeant. Well, now, how did you deal with such things as cavity searches and this sort of thing when you had men that you were supposed to be supervising? Did you ever have to, uh, I guess, get up close and personal with male inmates? No, I didn't myself. But other women later on had to, if there was no male around, they had permission to do that. But you had to search for a male officer. But that was much later in the career. I did not have that experience. I did with women, and that was not a pleasant thing either. And why was that? Well, um, a woman came to the penitentiary when I was working the visiting room, and I recognized her from reading the St. Louis paper that she was wanted for bank robbery. And so I called my boss, and my boss called the highway patrol. Well, I was the only woman there. They were not really prepared for that, but I had to go in and cavity search her, no gloves, no nothing. I think I referred to that in the book, too. And then when I started to feel in her hair, her wig came off, and in a little spot of hair on the top of her head was a knife. And uh, so... (laughs) I After that, I went to my boss and I said, you know, if I'm going to do these cavity searches and all of these, we need to have more things there. And so they did prepare. But at that time, you know, nobody really knew. But I did catch a bank robber. I was very proud of that. <laughs> How did you, that, you mean she, that, that woman or someone else? She was the woman coming to visit her husband oh. and she was the bank robber. I see. She was wanted. And she was hiding out under the wig. Mm-hmm. Yeah, her knife was. And that scared me. <laughs> well, Tella, you, you, you seem to paint a pretty nice picture of inmates as being somewhat uh, respectful to you. Uh, you say you had more problems with your fellow uh, uh, corrections officers than you did with the inmates. That's a, a pleasant picture, actually, considering that you're in a maximum security prison with men who are there for many, many years and have committed some serious crimes. What do you? How do you... Uh, How do you justify that, or how do you explain that they were so respectful under those circumstances? Well, see, I think I I was, I have to be honest about that. When I was at the penitentiary there, I was around more of the ones that had worked up to more high, lower level of security. And uh, I was not with the death row people and things like that. 
So I think these people, and, and back in, I think things were different back then. They could not call you by your first name unless they put Miss in front of it. Like what, I was what called year, Miss. What year were you, uh, at, or what years were you at the Missouri St- State Pen? From 66 to 74. Mm-hmm. And so it was just sort of a different type of, I mean, and there were, I'm not saying that inmates are not, that some of them are very much not to be trusted. Some are very violent. You know, inside of a penitentiary is a risk every time you walk into it. You, you make a but, comment in your book, you say, a prison is a society like no other. That's true. What do you mean by that? Well, I guess it it is a little town itself. You know, uh, like we had 2,000 or 3,000 at Missouri State Penitentiary. And you had all the basic runnings of a town, but the rules were different. Um, (laughs) You know, there were snitches you could pay for, but then they could go back and get killed, just like here on the streets. You had officers bringing drugs in you had to watch that you had um, escape plans we had James Earl Ray that escaped from there and um, we also uh, the thing of it is you an officer had to learn how to get the inmates to respect them because that was the key to most inmates if they respected you, they guarded your back. And I have an instance that I put in the book. I don't know if you remembered reading that, where it happened at a different security prison. It wasn't at the main penitentiary, um, where I knew they had my back. Right. Did Do you remember that? Right. Uh-huh. I do. And this is, can I tell this story? Go ahead. Well, I was, that was when I was a deputy warden, and I was approving people to go out for work release. And I had to put my name on it, and if they escaped, who did it come to? It came to me. So I was very careful about looking over the files. There was a young man that I turned down because I felt he was a risk. Well, he was not happy at all. And so as I was walking along, every lunch hour I would take a walk to keep in shape, you know. And outside, of this had a big barbed wire fence around it, and I heard from the housing unit somebody saying, Ms. Mertens, you old B. And, of course, it made me angry, and I knew the voice, but I couldn't do anything about it because technically I didn't see him. I just went in and stayed angry, you know, till the afternoon and the lieutenant came in and he said guess what happened to so and so and i said what he's in protective custody well protective custody is where an inmate goes if they're afraid of someone or something or whatever for their protection and then they get moved out well that guy went into protective custody and i know exactly why he went there is because the the inmates that respected me threatened him Mm-hmm. And that is the law, some of the laws of the prison. I accepted that protection. Was it right? I don't know. But, you know, that's some of the things you learned about a place and that you did. Language, too, uh, just like the gang language, the prison has a language, too. And that's, you know, there's just all kinds of different uh, uh, things like, we were square people. That's what they called us. The officers, uh, the corrections officers. Actually, anybody that wasn't an inmate did was you, a square. Did you, did you uh, adopt their language uh, at all, or did you continue to speak your language and they would speak theirs? I tried to do it, but occasionally, like, you get so used to it. If somebody, if I told them to send me a note, I would say, send me a kite. Because that's what they used kite as note. Yes, and so I did adopt some of it, but we tried not to, but, you know, you kind of just did. Tell us about, tell me about, uh, you mentioned about drugs, and uh, uh, that drugs 
have a strange way, strange ways of getting into a prison. Yeah. Uh, it, it, do, do inmates uh, regularly use drugs in prison? Are they able to get them pretty easily? Tell us about that. Well, I'm not speaking for anything today. I'm speaking of when I was there. You're right. But, and, and, and before we get into <clears throat> that, you actually served at three correctional institutions. The first one is the Missouri State Penitentiary from yes. 66 to 74. You served at the Wrens Correctional Center from 74 to 1982. And then your third facility was where? Well, actually, 82 is when I got my big promotion. I was still at Wrens. Right. It, I didn't go to Central Missouri Correctional Center till about 97. And then you, and you retired in 2000, so your final institution, you were there three years. Yes. And now you live in Virginia, right? Yes. Your, your, uh, your son, whom you raised all by yourself, really, single mom yeah. all these years as a corrections officer, very commendable. Mm -hmm. um, and your son, uh, despite some growing pains in his teen years, <laughs> apparently went on to uh, Georgia Tech, got a Ph.D. in physics. Mm -hmm. He's a doctor, a doctor now in, uh, in, in physics, and he works here, what, at Langley? Uh, NASA Langley. At NASA mm -hmm. Langley. So very good, uh, very, very good for you. And you've got some great grandchildren and some grandchildren. So good for you with, uh, you know, raising uh, this son um, under very... Uh, I'm sure difficult circumstances your whole life. We've only got a couple more minutes to go to break. If you've just joined us, um, I'm George Yates. Uh, this is Justice for All. And uh, my guest today is Joanne Mertens. She's a career correctional officer in the Missouri State uh, Penitentiary System. And you now uh, live in Virginia. And I think you actually uh, have not really completely retired, right, Joanne? You still working in some kind of corrections or volunteer volunteer work? Because I think you never really got away from this. You still love this work, don't you? I don't want to get away from it. I did work for almost ten years here in the Greater Williamsburg area as a probation officer, two days a week. But now I am retired, but I'm starting to volunteer. Uh -huh. I still want to work with the misfortunate. It's just something I know and, and I communicate with, and that's what I want to do. Well, that's great, you, and you're, you're probably really very good at it. We're going to go to a break right here, and when we come back, we're going to talk uh, with uh, Joanne Mertens about uh, racism in the penitentiary, about gangs, about violence, about what, what guards do, and all of the other things that uh, are actually quite a bit of interest when we're starting to talk about uh, maximum security um, institutions. We'll be right back with Justice for All. If finances are holding you back from enrolling your kids or grandkids in private Christian schools, call the radio station at 488-1010. We have a partnership program with several schools on the peninsula and the south side that allows us to offer a 35% discount off tuition for preschool through the 12th grade. Give us a call today at 488-1010 or visit our website at tuitionsolution.org. Did we mention we added daycares to the site? tuitionsolution.org. Have you or a loved one been accused of a crime? If so, the law firm of George H. Yates knows how to navigate the legal system and offer you the best possible defense. George is a former prosecutor and has valuable experience from both sides of the courtroom. Pick up the phone right now and call 757-491-8800. That's 757-491-8800. Great legal advice does not have to be expensive. Call 757-491-8800 now for a free consultation. Nor'easter season is here, so don't get all wet. Protect your house. Call Crawl Space Door Systems at 363-0005. Reduce your flood insurance, reduce the threat of mold and insects, and save energy. Crawl Space Doors, air vents, flood vents, vent covers, and fans can help you stay dry or get you dry quickly. Contact Crawl Space Doors for more information at 363-0005 or online at crawlspacedoors.com. Stay dry, my friends. You are out of water. You're out of order. Oh, I love that clip. I tell you what, you know, Justice for All, it's the greatest movie. Crazy. Al Pacino, right? Yeah. Anyway, so we're here with Joanne Mertens. Listen, um, I'm George Yates. This is Justice for All. Uh, one woman, three prisons. Joanne Mertens. Uh, what was your title uh, um, as a 
you were a, first a matron, and then later on you became a superintendent. One or what was your title in the in these uh, pr- in these prisons, Joanne? Well, I started out as a mail clerk, which was the lowest position there. Right. Then I went to matron and corrections officer one. Then I became a corrections officer two or sergeant, as you would call it. Then I wanted to go a little direct different direction because of the night work and and my son so i went to a record officer one and then i went to a record officer two and then i went to at that time they called them superintendent ones now they're more deputy wardens and i like that title better <laughs> well you um you mentioned in your book we talk about we t- we touched briefly on, on this uh, a few minutes ago you talk about drugs in a prison that they have strange ways of getting into the prison, and you also talk about your you, you have an opinion about about prisoners who use drugs and and what is I'm sure you've seen a lot of that. What's your opinion on drugs and the prisoners who use them? Well, I like I say, I can't speak for any other place, but there were quite a number of drugs in the prison systems, and not that we didn't try to keep them out. we did, but um there was something as simple as homebrew. I don't know if anybody knows what that is, but you could actually ferment anything, and it would become homemade beer, I guess you'd call it. So that was the least of the problem. Then um, there was a lot of crack cocaine, a lot of marijuana. Missouri had marijuana growing freely in its, uh, you know, uh, certain areas. And uh, the, mis- they came the in. marijuana was growing in the prison. No, no, not in the prison. Oh, <laughs> but it, out in the country, and right. actually, on at one of the prison farms I worked at, Wren's Correctional Center, we had to send people out to cut down the marijuana and what they called a loco weed, because they were both what you could get high on. Mm-hmm. But. Uh, the bigger penitentiaries, um, one of one of the ways they came in was, I'd say officers, but any staff that went down in the prison, they were vulnerable. Not not that many, but you know there were some. And then another way is if they were um, in what we call the minimum security visiting room, where they had personal contact. Now, I worked at first with a screen, but they could poke holes in that screen, and you had to be very careful because they could pass drugs through that hole. But then if they were in the visiting room where they could have a face-to-face visit, it could be brought in anywhere. You could search and search and do whatever you wanted to do, but it still could come in. I had to go to one institution to search babies because they thought the drugs were coming in that way. I didn't find them, but that was very hard for me to do was go search little children. One was in an infant seat. And, uh, you know, they bring them in that way. Women bring them in in any cavity they have. They can be passed with a kiss. They can be passed almost any way. And so, you know, there's... and. For the prison farms we had, like that were actually originally farms, they could come and throw it over a fence, and the officers had to be continuously vigil with that. Just during the break, a few minutes ago, we were listening to the CBS news break, and the part of the news program was that someone was smuggling heroin into a prison uh, mm-hmm. as part of a Bible. And I, I just heard that right in the middle of our show. Uh, really? There, yeah. Uh, they, had, I, I guess, it, you can do that by bringing the Bible in and taking each page and liquefying the drugs and and then just soaking the page and then you've got the the drugs actually part of the entire Bible. So there's uh, another very innovative way. Adam Planting, well, Adam Plantinger was a police a, a, a patrolman um, who was on my show a couple of weeks back wrote a book called 400 Things That Cops Know. And he talks amazingly about what, uh, he says, you'd be amazed at what people can get up in their body cavities. Uh, it's That's just true. extraordinary what a man or a woman can get into their body cavities. Uh, so I guess as corrections officers, you have to um, go through that whole process and making sure they don't get the drugs in, but they still do anyway. 
Well, um, so many of the men would swallow a balloon of drugs, but right. we, if we suspected it, we had a cell where they didn't do anything until they got rid of that balloon and we got it. Yeah. Oh, that was a that was a fun detail, huh? Trying to find yeah. the balloon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you you had to draw straws to see who didn't do that, right? <laughs> Well, you. Um, what about gangs? You, uh, you, uh, you, um, you, you refer to some of the older prisoners as OGs. What's an OG? Well, actually, my family argued with me about this. That there's a new name for it, but in the prison system, when I was there, it's old gangster, uh, old gangster, and that's somebody that's done a lot of time, and they're usually very well respected in the prison system. Mm-hmm. Kind of like, and, uh, kind of like, kind of like Red in yeah. Shawshank Redemption. You know, Red, the the uh, Morgan yeah, Freeman. Yeah, I haven't character. seen it for a while, but oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, and they are respected, and usually they are fairly well respected by the staff too. Mm-hmm. I had one guy that he and I followed each other all the way through my career, and, 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 uh, and he was an OG. Do you have stories about these OGs that didn't really want to get out, didn't want to go back home? Well, the worst case I ever saw was I was working the visiting room, and an old man came in. He was totally white-haired, and he had a little bag, and it had a toothbrush and something else in. He was an old-timer that got released, and... I guess none of his family were left or didn't want him. I don't know which it was, but he wanted to come back in. Mm-hmm. And the front gate officer that worked with me, and I didn't know what to do, but we had to turn that man away. And I guess today you might call somebody, you know, but back then they really didn't have uh, too much reentry or, or things of that sort that they have today. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, It just broke my heart that that man had no place to go, and he couldn't adjust to society. uh, That's something that I've heard for years. I was a prosecutor back in the 80s, and I've been a criminal Mm -hmm. defense lawyer now for more than 20 years. And we've heard that, uh, you know, now in Virginia we don't have parole, so it's not unusual at all for somebody to get a 25-year sentence, and they're going to pull that sentence. Is there any truth to that, that once somebody's done, and I always heard that the cutoff was 20 years, you know, once somebody's done 20 years, they're institutionalized and they can't really come back out. Are they, is there any truth to that, what, it, it, what, it, whether or not somebody can make it after a certain period of time? Yes. Uh, I don't say it would be exactly 20 years. The world changes so fast, I think it could be 10 years. And they even might have some problems with five years, you know, because of how fast the world goes. And it depends on if they have a good structure to go home to. Mm-hmm. That would depend on it because can you imagine never being out of the house for five to ten years and then walk out? Right, right. I do believe in in reentry, and I believe that every person that comes out, whether their intentions are good or not, needs a handheld for six months or more. Right, and we don't have the means to do that. You don't. What, what, no. Was there? Uh, do, do you see prisoners being rehabilitated? I mean, does prison rehabilitate people, or are we just housing people there and teaching them more uh, ways to be criminals? Well, um, there's uh, two different stories to that, and I think a lot depends on the type of prison you're in. I felt Missouri had some very innovative programs, and the key is if you wanted to try. That was the key. Mm -hmm. We had GED programs, and now I believe they're mandatory. I'm a little out of it from now, but uh, you have to get your GED. Back when I was there, they actually sent people out to the local college, and they got degrees. Mm -hmm. And I know some of the people were very successful. Now, one was not. Uh, You know, I know he he went on a stealing rampage and whatever, but um, there's drug programs now there's you know there's just a lot of things that are available and i can't say virginia because i've actually never been in a virginia prison Mm -hmm. but i do believe from going in our regional jail here that there are things that they can be helped with if they want to do it well what do you i i i 
there's been a lot. We've had some people on my show. Uh, we've talked about the mass incarceration uh, in uh, our country for about the last four decades, and you were uh, involved in that. You saw, you know, during your periods of time, you saw more and more people coming into the prison systems, not only in Missouri, but nationwide. Uh, what? And I think that that's an interesting topic. You pick up the New York Times now. You pick up a lot of these uh, journals. Uh, there's editorials about our where Eric Holder is releasing some of these uh, prisoners that have been uh, sentenced to these much longer periods of jail. And you probably more than anyone else would know, uh, at what point should we be releasing people? Are these long sentences necessary to protect people uh, or protect society, or should we be releasing people uh, sooner? I mean, when you were there in the prison, would you look at some of these inmates and say, you ought to be out of here. Uh, tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are on that. Well, uh, when I worked with the maximum security females, that was a whole different ball game. Uh-huh. And at that time, Missouri had um, a stipulation of 50 years without parole. Wow. And now everybody goes out on parole automatically in Missouri. So they have so parole they- now in Missouri again. Yeah. Oh, I've never known them not to. Well, we abolished it in Virginia, though, see, so... Yeah, mm -hmm. but I think it's a good thing because there is some supervision, you know. Yes, it takes more money and whatever. But anyway, um, some of those women were doing 50 years, they called them 50-year stips, is what we called them. And see, that's another prison jargon. But uh, some of the women was a crime, and that's with men too, a crime of passion that had to do with a spouse and our girlfriend or whatever, you know. And some of those would not commit another murder. Right. And I think they could be left, and in fact, I think they le- uh, the last governor of Missouri let almost all the 50-year steps out. Um but there were some that I, I read the files on, and they tell you never to read a file, but I had to. Um, but some of those were cold-blooded killers, and, you know, they, they need to stay. Right. So that's, I guess, the interesting, uh, you got to make that call, don't you? Uh, you do. As to <laughs> this person. <laughs> so you would, you would be able to do that yourself, uh, I'm sure, right? You could tell mm-hmm. yourself, so, uh-oh, this person right here, they need to stay right here in this penitentiary. And one woman got out that I worked with off and on for 20 years because we jumped from male to female to, you know, you probably read that in the book. Right. Uh, But she had not one conduct violation in 20 years. She was the perfect inmate. She killed her abusive husband. And she's gone out now to make, from what I can hear, a very good life for herself. But she spent at least 20 years in. Did did, and, you, did you see uh, people come back? Did you see people get parole and then come right back? <laughs> uh, oh yes. Oh really? Mm-hmm. Well, I, this this is one. You know, I've learned to. How would you say it? To understand these people, but there was one young girl that kept coming in, and uh, she had eight children, all by different fathers. She. Um, Her mother was taking care of them, and the mother had cancer, and she would get into drugs. And um, I talked to her before she went out, and I said, would you please, I said, first of all, I said, why would you not get your tubes tied? Because I talked to some of them very, you know, even the men, very bluntly. And uh, she said, because, now this was the rationale. Because if I ever get married, my husband might want a child. And, see, I had never thought of it that way. But she did. And I said, well, promise me, because your mother's sick, that you will not go out and get pregnant. Well, it probably wasn't six months till here she came in through reception, and she yelled, Ms. Mertens, how are you? And I said, fine, how are you? I'm not pregnant, she said. <laughs> what was she doing back? <laughs> well, at least she wasn't pregnant, but she'd, she'd broken the law. What was her yes. crime? Yes. What was her and crime? Some, that she, what was her crime? That it was got something her? to do with drugs. Oh, yeah. 
Well, they we keep are. locking up all these people for drugs. What's up? And you say, and you make a comment that you uh, you it was it looked very. I was impressed by it. And uh, if you've just joined us, I'm with Joanne Mertens, and she's written a book called One Woman Three Prisons. And you make a a very uh, I, I thought very sensitive. And uh, when you talk about the people that are using drugs are are self medicating, and that they are all trying to do something really to kill the pain of their lives. Uh, what, what's your Tell us more about that. Well, now, I'm not a substance abuse counselor or anything like that, but I've certainly seen my share. And what I have observed is that it starts very early, and this can be rich or poor. They say sometimes the poor are more disadvantaged. I think they are. But then a rich kid can be as lonely as a poor kid. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes from the family background and how... They want to hide their pain. There's a lot of abuse of kids, and all of these pains, alcoholic parents, drug-addicted parents, uh, just socially, social butterfly parents and things like that, where the kid grows up and turns to drugs to fight the pain that they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And I I have not gotten a clear idea on... um, ADD and ADHD and some of these, but I don't understand. I know they were diagnosing most, but I think some of this, there has to be something in the background that's causing this. Yeah. I, I just don't believe it's all, they're not born with it. Yeah, it's just a and shame that they're, ha- it seems, it, and, and they do have now some uh, drug treatment programs in prison, but aren't, shouldn't these people be somewhere other than prison? Shouldn't they be, uh, why, why do we house uh you know, drug addicts along with all the other violent criminals. And, and along, and well, while I'm asking you that question, what about the mentally ill? Uh, how many of these people were in there that you looked, that you thought were mentally ill and also didn't deserve to be in prison? Well, the mentally ill are a totally different case, and it's very, very sad because we do not have facilities to take the mentally ill. Uh, they, they've closed almost all of that down. Right. And, and many of the mentally ill are homeless because they don't take their meds. They can't work. They can't do all of this. So the only place they've got to go is prison. Mm-hmm. I remember we had one woman that killed another woman in a um, mental hospital. And guess where she came? She came to us. But she was mentally ill and came from a mental hospital. Yeah, it seems like uh, in front, we have sort of three different, and I, and I know that we can stratify prison life in so many different ways, but you've got people that are that are violent, and then you've got the people that are uh, mentally ill like that, and then you've got the people that are, crimes are mainly involving drugs. Does the mm-hmm. prison system try to do a good job of sep- separating or segregating these people so that perhaps they can get rehabilitated and not be the subject of violence and other kinds of, uh, you know, problems? I think, as far as I'm speaking of Missouri, I think they do, but it's still, it's still hard. Right. And I would like to say something right now. I do have a very strong feeling about drugs. I do not believe that pot should be legalized ever. Right. And, <clears throat> I and why do is not that? Be- because, to me, no matter what you say, it's a gateway drug, if you're sitting there high on pot and they offer you cocaine or heroin, you're much more likely to take it. Um, I think our kids are just overwhelmed now with pot and legal prescriptions. You know, I, it just really scares me how many are dependent on these kind of things. Right now, and, I don't. And the whole thing, the whole thing about mental health is if you start reading about mental health. The first thing uh, in order to get mentally healthy, if you've got mental illness, is to make a commitment to reality. And, mm-hmm. and marijuana, despite the fact that it's not as harmful as some of these other drugs, and no, no doubt about that, it's not as debilitating as the cocaine, the heroin, and so on. But there's no question that when you, um, when you smoke it, you are 
you're not in reality for a while. You're somewhere no, else. And you are. And therefore, your chances of mental illness increase. I don't know, say everybody that does mar- marijuana is mm-hmm. mentally ill, but if you're already mentally ill or predisposed to mental illness, then it can't certainly help you in getting, you know, in, get, in getting your mind right. You can't make that commitment to reality. Same with alcohol. If you're going to drink moderately, that's one thing, but the people that, mm-hmm. drink, that drink too much, well, now they're not based in reality either, and that's what all drugs really do. Well, and at, at, we used to do intelligence tests on people coming in, and I happened to run across one person who came in when he was like 18 or 19 for just a small drug charge, and he was listed as highly intelligent. He came back several years later after marijuana, cocaine, and whatever, and he had gone down below average intelligence. Yes. So I think it does affect your brain. Oh, yeah. I used to say this about marijuana. It it, it seemed like it knocked everybody down around 10, 15 points of IQ. So Mm -hmm. if you got some highly intelligent guy, you know, he's already got 140 IQ. He's brilliant. He, mm-hmm. he smokes a little pot. He's down to 125. No, no problem. He's still smarter than everybody in the room. Yeah. But, but if you've got a 100 IQ or a 95, and now you're smoking marijuana, you're knocking yourself down to the 70s, and you're, you're really, really hurting yourself. And I do think that there's some truth to that, that it does slow you down. And, um, and just it, anyway, but uh, I want to move on before because we've just got a few minutes left. And if you've just joined us uh, and, and thank you for being with us today, uh, uh, Joanne, it's been been a fun interview so far. What you well, talk, enjoyed it. you talk about gangs a little bit. And I think a lot mm-hmm. of, you know, while we're, this is a radio show, it's entertainment. Tell us something sexy about gangs. I know that there's all kinds of gangs in the prisons. And, and what, what are your favorite stories about gang life while you were a uh, corrections officer? Oh, well, I don't know if I could tell you anything sexy. <laughs> we we had uh, various, we had probably different gangs in here. We had the big St. Louis Bloods and the Crips like they have today. We had a real big rash of what they call Aryan Brotherhood. Not so much the KKK, but they were Aryan, and they were a very dangerous gang. And then we had different um religious sects that were technically what I'd call a gang but went under religion and one of them was the Moorish Science Temple of America and I guess what I had the fun with is learning the signals learning the clothes learning the tattoos um and I still don't know half of them because there's a tremendous amount and I would come in and, you know, somebody would come in and talk to me, and I'd get on the subject, and pretty soon we'd, I'd hear about the gang life a little bit, you know, where the bus were. And I even did that in Virginia here. I, I know on this side of the water a lot of the places where you can go and get drugs or where the gangs hang out, you know. So, and, and so, they're and, very and, dangerous. And, and, right. And so did, did there – was there a problem in the prisons with uh, – did the Bloods and the Crips fight? Did the Aryan yes. Brotherhood, the Aryan Brotherhood, I guess, was that a white supremacy type That's gang? That's a white supremacist group, yeah. And then you said the Nation of Islam was a very peaceful and cooperative group. That's interesting to hear. That's a Muslim well, group. No, well, there were some, there were not. Mm-hmm. That, that was a mixed bag. Some people used it as a shield for what they wanted to do where others were okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the Moorish Science Temple of America was much more militant, and I don't know if that's even around in in this area or not. Uh But um, if you look on um, Google or somewhere, and you uh, Google Jerry Lewis Bay, B-E-Y, he was the notorious Muslim gangster In St. Louis, he had the longest trial in St. Louis history. He was responsible for the biggest drug cartel in Missouri, and I had the privilege of working with him. (laughs) Were were guards were guards ever violent with prisoners? Mm, I'd have to say sometimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had what they call uh, use of force investigations, and. It's just kind of like the police today. Is it or isn't it? How far does it go? 
mm-hmm. you know, and we had to settle that, and some were over violent and but as far as an inmate, I saw a little female inmate come over an officer with a shield in front of him when he let her out of the unit, and she just beat the heck out of him, so you know, I think she got a little few little repercussions there you know from that and you saw but, the and you saw the rise of women prisoners more so too during your career more and more women yes. coming into the prisons i saw one come in pregnant with an iv in her arm because the sheriff didn't want to pay for the health care oh god well listen we've so, only got just a couple more minutes is there anything that you would like to say i know i've been asking a lot of questions that are of interest to me but we've just got a minute or two left joanne tell me what what is there anything that that you would like to talk about in the next uh, minute or so that we haven't really discussed? Well, just the one thing I'd like to, I'd like to plug my book that you could find it on Amazon.com. And we will do that, and I will also put it on my website here on Justice for All. And you okay. can get this book on uh, Amazon.com. It's Joanne M. Mertens. That's M-E-R-T-E-N-S. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. One Woman, Three Prisons, The Rise Within the Ranks. And she mm-hmm. was in the penitentiary system in Missouri from June of 66 to June of 2000. It's available on Amazon right now, so go get it. And we'll also put it on our on our website uh, as well. So um, anything else you'd like to talk about? Well, I would say that I loved my career in criminal justice. You definitely did. I could tell that from your book. It, and I am sorry today that I'm not fully into it again. I guess there comes a time you have to lay it down. Mm-hmm. But I'm still, it's my passion. Besides my family, it's my passion in life. Well, you can certainly tell by uh, not only the book that when you read it, but also the way you've uh, conducted this interview today. I mean, I'm, uh, you, you have a lot of insight in a lot of the things that we discussed here today we didn't weren't even really in your book i asked you a lot of things that were not in the book because uh and your book could have been even much more longer and and much i'm sorry much longer and and even have more to it so hopefully you get some more interviews to uh to talk about it and uh i'd like to take this opportunity then say thank you very much to uh to joanne mertens uh thank you very much joanne for being on the show well i thank you it was a good interview Thank you so much. All right. Well, you go off and join your family this afternoon and have a great day. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. So so that's it with Joanne Mertens. We're going to come back in just a little bit. This is Justice for All. I'm George Yates. We've got another hour to go in the show. Uh, we're going to come back and do a little CBS News and a few uh, words from our sponsors. And we'll be right back with the second hour of Justice for All. 